Uh, Oaks and I, uh, my son, we uh, often go fishing. Um, for those who follow me at all or just as I post stuff on there, my son is at the age where he doesn't like it when I post pictures of him. Um, he doesn't mind when I post pictures of him holding big fish that he caught, but uh, in general, it's not his favorite. But, um, but we love doing it, and we spend a good amount of the summer fishing. Um, and he's been quite successful, actually, in, in doing it. But the activity that we do, Oaks and I, it is a human catching a fish. But today we're going to unpack a story where the opposite is true. We're going to look at a fish that's catching a human. And so with that being said, what we're going to do, turn your Bibles to the book of Jonah. Um, it, it, I go through the series and often uh, go over a lot of scripture. We're going to do that today, but at least we're going to be confined to the book of Jonah. So it'd probably be good. You actually can kind of follow the story. Um, you're going to have a hard time finding Jonah because it's not easy. So once you get to like... Uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, you keep going, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, and then you get to a couple more over, you get to Jonah. And so we're going to look at the story of Jonah, we're going to break it up into four scenes, and then we're going to talk about what we should actually take home from this very well-known and iconic story. All right, let's look at the first scene. We look at, with me at Jonah, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. It says this. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, and he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Okay, stop there. So uh, we're introduced right now to Jonah, okay, the son of Amittai. Jonah is a prophet, but we see here that God gives him a mission. And obviously this mission that Jonah is given, he is not down with this particular mission. He does not want to go on this mission, now, at this point of the story, we aren't told why Jonah responds like this. All we know is this is not the ideal response from one of God's prophets. Let's also stop here, and we need to talk about three details of this story that's super important. Number one, detail number one, Jonah is a prophet of the northern kingdom. Jonah is a prophet of the northern kingdom. 2 Kings 14 talks about it. You'll see it in front of you. In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria. And he reigned 41 years. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he had made Israel to sin. He restored the border of Israel from Lebo Hamath as far as the Sea of Arabah, according to the work of the Lord, the God of Israel. Here we go. Which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from Gath, Heper. This is the only part of the Bible that actually tells us that Jonah is a prophet of the northern kingdom. To help you understand, remember, last week we talked about everything was going good, relatively speaking, in Israel, okay? Saul became their first king. Saul did not do a good job. Then David rose up, okay? David was a man of war, a man of blood, trying to establish the united kingdom. All together, Israel was. Then his son came into the throne, Solomon, and 40 years of prosperity and peace, okay? Okay? And wealth beyond what we can imagine. But things went sideways. And handing off the baton to his son, everything went literally sideways at that point. And from that time, we have the northern kingdom, which was constructed of basically the ten tribes. And then we have the southern kingdom, which is of Judah, which was basically the tribe of Judah, Benjamin, and the Levites stuck it out and hung out with the southern kingdom. Nothing more is known about the prophetic ministry of Jonah in the northern kingdom, which leads us to detail number two. A prophet being sent to a foreign nation is unusual. A prophet being sent to a foreign nation is unusual. 
As a whole, the prophets of God in the Old Testament were commissioned to speak to the people of God. You were a prophet, you spoke to the people of God. But there were exceptions. Obadiah was given a message to deliver to Edom. Nahum was given a message to Nineveh 150 years after Jonah talked to the Ninevites. Jeremiah was called to be a prophet to the nations. But again, this was not normal prophetic procedure. Listen to me. The Old Testament prophets uh, were raised up to remind Israel, you are supposed to be a light to the nations. Israel was supposed to be the nation that other nations looked to and went, we want to serve that God. We want to come into covenant with that God. We hear about this God doing supernatural things, rescuing them from Egypt, miraculous things that are done. This is an actual real God. And that they would look at a nation that aligned their hearts to God and the people would come and go, tell us more about the God, our creator of the universe. The problem was, Israel rarely lived up to that. And the primary role of prophets were to go and get Israel to repent and get back on track. Which leads us to detail number three. Nineveh was an evil place. Look again at Jonah 1, 2. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call it against it, for their evil has come up before me. Okay, what is the evil that is so significant that God is going to judge this city of Nineveh? Well, we're not exactly sure, but Jonah 3.8 gives us some idea. It says this, But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that's in their hands. Violence. We think that was their great evil. Well, is there historical and archaeological evidence to back this claim that Nineveh's main sin, greatest sin, was that they were a violent people? Yeah, there sure is. Here we go. Buckle up. The Assyrians, known in history, they were known to hang their enemies on posts, flay them, line the city walls with their skin. They also burned their enemies or beheaded them if they were fortunate. Those still alive would have their nose, ears, eyes, arms, and other extremities removed. During the reign of Shalemeser the third, they found bronze, bronze bands that were wrapped around the doors of that era. And that substantiates this claim. Look, this is one of those bronze bands that we now have as archaeological data. And if you can see, what do you see? You see these bands depict Assyrian soldiers hacking apart the captured enemy alive, dismembering their hands and their feet. You see it on this bronze band. We also know that it was common for heads were hung from walls during his reign, and he impaled captives, and they were lined up on display. Pillars of skewered human heads stood like totem poles. Another account that Assyrian kings used to walk through the streets of Nineveh wearing necklaces of decapitated heads. Finally, we have historical and archaeological evidence from King Sennacherib's Prism. This prism gives an account. You, it's hard to see, but there's writing, obviously, all over. Okay, this prism. And the account that's given, among others, in that, on that prism, it talks about King Sennacherib bragging that he created so much blood from death and disembowelment that his horses waded through it like a river. And I apologize for this next part, but this is written down, and even ripping out of men's testicles like seeds of summer cucumbers. Even the prophet Nahum aptly described Nineveh as a bloody city. Look, Nahum 3.1. Woe to Nineveh, woe to the bloody city, all full of lies and plunder, no end to their prey. So, we think... Jonah ran away from this message because Jonah didn't like the Ninevites. Jonah believed that the Ninevites should burn. Jonah probably believed that there should be no justice, there should be no mercy, there should be justice, there should be no mercy, there should be no grace given to the Ninevites. God should do to them what they did to other nations. And by the way, the Assyrians wouldn't flinch to do the same thing to the Israelites. So... Jonah said, nope, 
and he ran away about what God wanted him to do. Which leads us to the second scene. Look with me at Jonah chapter 1, verse 4. I'm going to read quite a few verses here. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. And the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was from the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said, Hey, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to, to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil had come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? And he said to him, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because that's what he told them. And then they said to him, What shall we do to you, that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea was growing more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea, that the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to try to get to dry land, but they could not, for the sea was growing more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on innocent blood for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. And the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Okay, here we go. <laughs> All right, so Jonah, in running away from the presence of God, hops on a boat, okay? God sends a strong wind, which produces a crazy storm. This is such a bad storm that the boat is now starting to break apart. To combat this, the sailors are tossing stuff off overboard and starting to pray to their gods. Please save us. We didn't mean to anger you. But what's Jonah doing the whole time? Asleep in the inner part of the ship. So the captain finds Jonah sleeping, tells him to get up. Probably first to just get him to help. Hey, we're dying here, basically. Get up, you lazy person, and help us. Throw stuff off the boat. Cry out to your God. Maybe your God will make this stop. And I'm sure at this point, Jonah, mind you, is looking around going, yeah, I bet this is because of me. But notice he doesn't say anything yet, okay? He's starting to throw stuff overboard. He's kind of hoping he can stay under the radar. And then they cast lots, which is like the old school way of like, you kind of do, you know, like what's about the biggest straw, basically, okay? And it comes to Jonah. And they're like, fess up, man, what's going on? And then he basically fesses up. I serve the God of Israel, the God who created all of this, and I'm running from him. And they're like, man, so what can we do to get this to stop? It's your fault. And Jonah actually says, you probably need to toss me off the boat. Now, look, <laughs> you've got to give credit to the captain and the sailors. Like, I get Jonah paid his fare, but it's their fault, the, bro the boat, his fault that the boat was about to break up. Toss that guy off the boat. Do they really care about him that much? But they try to row in. They try to, like, do it themselves. But it gets worse and worse and worse. So they finally throw him over, and he gets thrown into the sea. I want you to notice that the worldview, the religious worldview of people back in ancient times, back then they believed that there was a god of the sky or a god of the ocean or a god of the storms. They believed that that god that's causing this is angry and you've got to appease this god. That's why they're saying pray to your god, pray to your god, pray to your god somehow so we can make this better. There was also a worldview in that time that if something bad happened, you did something bad and the God is punishing you. Ironically, that is in a sense what's going on. Jonah is in trouble because he is running from the presence of God. But just to be clear, most of the time that we experience natural disasters here in our world, earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, 
listen to me, generally speaking, this is just because of the fall of man. Some people like to say that because of certain sins, this earthquake or this tornado or this happened. You have to be careful with that thinking. Has God done that? God did that in human history? He did. Look, until God makes everything right and brings in a new heaven and a new earth, there's going to be earthquakes and tornadoes and floods and wars and rumors of wars until Jesus returns. Okay? But in this circumstance, God is actually not happy with Jonah. So, he gets thrown over, and then we read what happens. Verse 17. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me out of the belly of Sheol. I cried, and you heard my voice. And I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah upon dry land. Jonah here was swallowed by a great fish. Could have been a whale, we don't know, but it was a great fish. And by the way, if you're a skeptic in this room, there's plenty of evidence that would argue that there's a big enough fish that could actually swallow a human whole, and so this is actually naturally possible. That being said, he was swallowed up by a fish. Now look, we know that Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, but you must remember, Jonah didn't know that. Jonah thought, I bet two thoughts were going on in Jonah's head concurrently. The first one, please, God, help me. Like, please, I'm so sorry, get me out of here. And two, this is how I'm going to die? This is how I'm going to go. In the belly of a whale or a fish, great fish. He didn't know if it was going to be a day or two or seven. I mean... They, they think that obviously the bodily, or the fluids that chew up things for the digestive tract is gnawing at Jonah. There's some historical facts that possibly when Jonah got vomited up, his skin has been discolored because the acid had begun to eat at his skin. None of that's cool and fun to think about. And yet, three days, three nights passed. And God saved Jonah from the belly of that whale. Which leads us to the third scene. All right, so he's got vomited out. Now what? Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call it against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. And Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days' journey in breath. Jonah began to go into the city, going in a day's journey. And he called out, yet 40 days Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. And they called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. Wow! Nineveh repented. From the king all the way to the poorest citizen of Nineveh. They repented. They turned back to God. God spared them. I bet Jonah was pumped up, right? I bet Jonah was like, all right. They came to God. I'm so excited, right? You think that's what Jonah did? I mean, he should be. That's his job. That's what prophets do. They turn people back to God. Well, let's see how he responded. Fourth scene. Jonah 4, 1 through 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in the, my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? <laughs> okay, Jonah's ticked off. Do you see what he's accusing God? I knew you'd be gracious. <laughs> I knew you'd be merciful. That's what you do. You're a God who's long-suffering. I knew you were going to do what you say you do. And Jonah's so angry about it. He's so angry about it that he doesn't want to live anymore. Listen to me. That's some deep-seated hatred and prejudice. That you'd rather die than watch a bunch of Ninevites live. So now, I'm not going to read this part of the story. Jonah goes outside of the city. 
he's still hoping that God's going to burn that place to the ground like Sodom and Gomorrah. So he's sitting back outside of the city. He builds like an enclosure over himself. And then something strange happens. God actually appoints like a plant to go over to provide Jonah shade so Jonah can kick back in hopes that God will destroy Nineveh. And then the next day, he wakes up and God appoints a worm to eat up this plant. So Jonah is under his enclosure, now the sun beating on him, hoping that God will destroy Nineveh. He has a mild sunstroke, passes out, and then gets angry at God again. (laughs) And then God says this to him. You care about this plant so much right now. And it was alive for one day. Which, by the way, you didn't grow, Jonah. I did. But I, God, shouldn't care about 120,000 people and their cattle? And the story ends. And the story ends. So, what do we learn from the story of of Jonah. I think the first thing we learn is that you can run away from his blessings, but not his plan. You can run away from his blessings, but not his plan. Jonah was given a mission, and he literally ran from it. The interesting thing is, it seems that he wasn't running away from his calling or office of a prophet. He ran away at his particular mission that God gave him to do. He didn't want that one. He was fine being a prophet to the northern kingdom, calling them to repentance. He was not down with calling Nineveh to repentance. So he ran. And this is what we often do, running from God's will. And family, by doing that, we run from his blessing. Maybe some of you need to be reminded, what's the blessing, though, about obeying God's will? What's the blessings? Here's a few. Seeing God work. By obeying God's will, you get to see God work. Just this week, I had somebody come up to me and offered me something that happened on last week of they got to see God work because they did something that they didn't really want to do, but they knew that was God's will. They'll, this person would probably say they, they didn't even believe that God was going to actually show up, but then God did, and it floored them. By seeking after God and obeying him, we get to see him work. The other bless, some of the other blessings are enjoying greater intimacy with God. Have some of you, metaphorically speaking, been in the belly of a great fish? And I ask you this, because I don't think any of you have. I hope not, or if you have, you should tell me that story, because that's awesome. Anyways, um, but I bet many of you have been through seasons of time where you felt hopeless and God showed up and it was a sweet time to be with God. And so some of the blessings that we have when we obey him is greater intimacy with God. Some of the blessings that we have by following God is you become mature in the faith. You grow. You go from being a baby to a mature adult in the faith. This is huge. By obeying God, you live with a clear conscience. Some of you don't. You fight all the time, dabbling with sin, dabbling in this world, disobeying what you know that God wants you to do. And he lets you run, and he lets you kind of have your way for now, but you're miserable when you're alone in your thoughts. You can drown it out by social media. You can drown it out by work. You can drown it off by pursuing the flesh. You can drown it out. But when you are alone, in the quietness of your soul, your conscience is not quiet. And finally, you are able to enjoy the rest that God provides when you obey him. Which seems backwards. Sometimes we look at obeying God's laws as heavy and burdensome. It actually is what sets you free. Next, we learn from this story that God in this story will use any means to get you to wake up. God will use any means to get you to wake up. God used a great fish with Jonah... God used with me a knee injury. My senior year of high school, I hurt my knee, I had to have surgery, and my basketball career was done. It was not that dramatic because I wasn't that good, but for me it was. And God used that to bring me to that place. He got my attention to put me on the path 
to serve him and follow him. God knows exactly what it's going to take to wake you up. Now, if you're a non-Christian this morning and you continue to resist God's will, he'll give you what you want. Just know that. If you keep running away from God, he'll give you what you want. He'll let you go your own way. He'll even let you have an eternity away from him. I pray you don't. But he'll let you go your own way. But if you are a Christian, you are his child. And if you are a Christian and his child, then God promises this, Hebrews 12, 11, For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Which means fatherly discipline, though painful, is meant to yield the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Therefore, followers of Jesus, you cannot lose your salvation according to Scripture, but you can lose the blessing. And I want you to enjoy both. Enjoy salvation now and for all eternity and enjoy the blessings that God has. Next, we see from this story that God desires all people to repent and believe. All people. Even the king that walked around with decapitated heads like a necklace, yeah, even that king. So none of you get to look at me and go, God's salvation can't be for me. I've done too much. You got decapitated heads with kings, filleting human flesh, his image bearers. The offer of salvation is for them also. How wide is God's mercy? How wide is his grace to us? That's for all people. The worst of all sinners. We also learn that God's servants are flawed people. God's servants are flawed people. <laughs> Jonah comes off in this story as cowardly, prejudiced, angry, irrational, basically stomping his feet like a petulant child. Man, the more I read the Bible, the more God becomes so much bigger, and then he is the main character, he is the hero. And us humans, it's shocking God even uses us. <laughs> but he does. And if we're honest, I bet you in the, if you were honest with your own heart, there's probably many of us that still are fairly prejudiced about certain people in the world. Look. I'm all for God providing salvation to everybody unless it's like a child molester, then I'm not so cool with that, if I'm like being honest. Like, not, not, I don't believe that is truth, but like my feelings on that. Is there not salvation for that person? According to the Bible, there is. Murderers. People that do awful atrocities. If they will humble themselves and come to God, then his, the whiteness of his mercy, he brings them in. And that person becomes a brother or sister in Christ who should and should be welcomed in one way or the other, but certainly if they have embraced salvation to sit next to you, sitting side by side, worshiping God. What a crazy thought. We love that truth. When we came to God far from him. We love that truth when we ran away from God for a long time and came back to him. We pretty much love that unless it's somebody that we would rather they just get judged and sent away for all eternity. And if that's you, I hope that you ask for forgiveness for God to have that thinking and mindset. Because you don't understand the gospel. But I say that to remind you that Jonah is just like us. Struggling to embrace the wideness of God's mercy. Even when we don't think he should. But why does God do it? Why does God use us? Well, for two reasons. There's a lot, but two primary ones. One, somehow it brings God more glory. I mean... I don't know, when he went back to the northern kingdom, assuming Jonah, we'll get to in a second, even continued in his prophetic ministry, but um, when he got back, I wonder how he was well received. I mean, I bet a bunch of Israelites were hoping the Ninevites would be burned anyways. But if there were people that came to him and heard the stories of how 
God rescued the Nineveh from the king down to the poorest citizen, gave their hearts, turned to God. Jonah, if he's honest, can take no credit for any of it. <laughs> not only can he not take credit because it's God that changed the hearts of men, he literally ran away from his mission. <laughs> He ran away so much that he had to put other people in jeopardy, which, by the way, seemed to come to God themselves. So God was orchestrating a lot of different things through Jonah's disobedience. Had a great fish swallow him up, vomited on the shore, uh, and, and still, through all of that, he went in and finally did proclaim the message that God had for him, but he wasn't even happy then. He complained about it and wanted to die. <laughs> so Jonah had nothing to say to that Israelite that came to him going, isn't that awesome what God did? And he's like, yeah, it is awesome what God did. And I am completely humbled that he even used me and still wants to use me. Do you know how terrible I was? <laughs> but, but that's how good God is, right? And that's why he gets the glory. Not Jonah. God got the glory for that. But it also made Jonah get on his knees. Maybe he got up again, but he got on his knees. And I think that's why God uses us, so that we will come to him and that he gets the glory. Lastly, your story is not finished. Your story is not finished. For those who followed his story and was reading with me, the ending of Jonah is not satisfying. We're left with so many questions. What happened to Jonah? Did he correct his heart and go back to being a prophet? Did he stay bitter and prejudiced? Did he grow in godliness and maturity? In other words, how did his story end? We don't know. The only time Jonah is brought up in the New Testament is that he is the example of Jesus being buried for three days and three nights, like the prophet Jonah. But he's not talked about in some upright way in the New Testament. We don't know what happened with Jonah. And in one sense, that's unsettling, and I don't know why God did it that way. But maybe he did it because it reminds us that your story is not finished. Maybe the mystery of what happened to Jonah reminds us that we today can lay ourselves bare before God and you can have a different story from this day moving forward. This is why I loved, in many senses, having a baptism and listening to the testimonies of those who were baptized. I'm looking at one that I won't highlight right now, but this particular person told me through tears that she, by God, being patient with her and changing her heart, she had a different story now, that her story could be different. She was on the path of a life away from the blessings of God, but her story is now different, and your story can be different, no matter how old you are, and no matter how young you are. Reborn. Reborn. And so we look at Jonah, and we don't have the answers. Maybe Jonah did turn the corner. Maybe Jonah continued down bitterness and prejudice, and that's why we don't hear from him ever again. I don't know the reason why, but I do know this. Your story is not finished. But to get to that place where you want your story to be God's story in your life, you need to go to him. The path forward is you going today, starting today. No matter if you've been walking closely with him or you've been away from him, you want to be in the center of what God is doing, no matter what that means. And it may mean that he's going to send you to Nineveh. Hey, actually, remember, we've already been sent to Nineveh because that's what's going on out there. <laughs> so I wonder if that is what some of us just need to hear. That, yes, we like... <laughs> 
It's kind of easy to be your pastor for the most part. Some of the times it's not very fun, but most of the time it's pretty easy. Truly, it's not, it's not so hard. Uh, you're fairly respectful to me. Um, we usually have good conversations. Um, you know, we get to walk a journey together. But it's safer to, to do it in here. It's not so safe to do it out, out there. And so we learn from the, the life of Jonah that to place you in the middle of God's plan means you go to him and say, whatever you want from me in my life, I will do it. And when he says go, you go. And by doing that, you'll live in the blessings of God. You'll probably confuse Christian people who are supposedly your friends because it's going to seem so weird and rare that you just unabashedly trust to God and move forward. You ever met a person like this? What are you doing? I don't know. God seemed to say that I got to go do that. Those are terrible people. No, I know, but God told me to go do that. Oh, that's cool. Reconcile with a family member. Go to a neighbor that needs the Lord, so on and so forth. I don't know what that is for you. I just know I live with that same beautiful truth that my story, in a sense, begins today. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for a story like Jonah um, that reminds us of, of, of a messy, a flawed human, but a human who was given a calling and ran from it, but ultimately um, your will was accomplished, and ultimately we got to see you show mercy to a very wicked and violent people. I pray that your mercy goes forth and grace goes forth into our nation, into our state, into our community. I pray that that is attached to us being bold with proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray for those who may feel beat up this morning, that they will remember that you are here, that you are present, that you are the father, the prodigal son that is waiting and looking and watching for you to come home and then run and embrace you and bring you back in to enjoy all the blessings that comes from being a part of the family of God. I pray that these individuals will come home. And Father, I pray that uh, for those, their stories before this, Maybe their stories was a story of shame or a story of guilt or a story of still trying to be pleased and find pleasure in the world. May their story from this moment on be a story where they trusted in you, that they enjoyed the freedom of this life, that you rescued them from some of the shackles that you have rescued us from that we put on ourselves. Help us to live as you have said that we now live, free, forgiven, peaceful, hopeful lives. Empower us to do that today. In Jesus' name, amen.